So excited to be here, extremely nervous uh, at this, uh, you know, this wonderful crowd uh, here. Uh, thanks to the Empire uh, team for uh, bringing uh, somebody like myself, uh, security uh, and outsider to a developer event. That's, that's uh, very, uh, very grateful of you. Uh, as stated, I'm Adam Baldwin. Here's where you can find me on the internet. Uh, Chief Security Officer at Andiet, the, the team lead at uh, the security division, uh, Lyft Security, which is also part of Andiet. Uh, and I founded and maintain uh, the Node Security Project. Uh, it's been a three plus year endeavor to make security a, a core value within the Node community, something that I'm uh, extremely passionate about. Uh, so to start my talk, I would like you to imagine a world. A world in which you've discovered an amazing technology. This could or could not be JavaScript. You put all your passion into seeing it come alive. Users, they're flocking to your platform, and it's used and adored by all. There's no question as the security and privacy of your technology. You have firewalls, experts on staff, and you have assured your users that you've thought of everything. But in the end, you couldn't account for everything. Eventually, the hackers outsmarted you, and on your company's grave, was we took security very seriously. <laughs> so companies actually don't die mostly because of breaches. Uh, after most, uh, most breaches happen, stocks tend to rise after a small dip. So I kind of started things off with a little bit of, uh, little bit of fear and certainty and doubt. Um, and I actually don't think you should ever use this phrase as part of a breach. But, but the silly beginning uh, really it shows us that Jurassic Park actually has a lot to teach us about security. So if you get nothing out of my talk, uh, just go rewatch Jurassic Park, and chances are you'll be in a good place to write secure software afterwards. Um, I tend to sit around and think about security, like a lot. Uh, if I've had a conversation with, uh, with you, chances are I've annoyingly turned it into a conversation about security in some way or another. Uh, I'm sorry for that. Um, for the last eight years, I've been working to bring what I know about security to dev communities. Uh, initially, it was the Python community, uh, and now I do a lot with Node and JavaScript. And I'm trying to work uh, how to bring the knowledge from the security community into the dev community without sort of just being uh, that community, that security community that just points and laughs and says, you've got flaws, fix them. Um, so I'm going to talk today about uh, continuous security. Uh, and the goal of continuous security, it's about understanding that security is not a binary state, right? It's not, it's not an insecure, you're not secure or insecure. I actually hate the word uh, secure. It lies to us. It makes us think that uh, we have, uh, that, that we're at 100% um, secure and that nothing can, nothing can harm us. And that's just a, that's just a, it's just a lie. Um, because there's things that we just can't, we just can't predict. Uh, just in Jurassic Park, didn't predict the raptors would get out and eat everybody. Um, the, 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 we, we can't predict things in the future, and so we should stop. Um, this talk is about the mindset of, of sort of stopping that and realizing that we're going to have vulnerability, we're going to uh, have situations that we can't predict, and how to sort of like deal with those. Uh, and I'm not going to talk about technical things, uh, get into cross-site scripting and SQL injection and things like that, because... Um, that's not what this is about. Uh, so let's see. Uh, to me, security is uh, like the Penrose Stairs. And if you've seen another talk I've give, given, you've probably seen me mention this. Uh, because this just rings so true to me that uh, security is all about the ever-improving discipline uh, that, of, of development of ourselves. And you don't get to the top of a staircase by simply like leaping to the top stair right? It's not going to happen. You do it one step at a time. And that's how I like to teach about security, um, because it also becomes less daunting uh, in terms of what uh, you have to do to improve your discipline, right? You don't have to do everything that every security talk or every reference uh, out there says to be, uh, to, be, to be good. You don't have to do that all at once. You don't have to take on that anxiety. So it's about switching, this talks about switching also the, the um, 
from a sprint mentality in the development world to more of a marathon thinking uh, because you will never reach that 100%. You will never reach that, that binary one that is secure. You only approach it. Uh, so it's also about uh, sort of reaching a maturity of being comfortable with vulnerability, being comfortable with humility uh, of code not being great, being vulnerable. Uh, so what, that's, to me, what sort of we're going to talk about today. And that's three, three areas are keeping vulnerabilities out of production. We're going to talk there, uh, talk about production code, and we're going to talk about security culture, sort of what I feel is, is the most important aspect. Jesus, that's, that's big. Um, okay. <laughs> keep looking, keep looking here. Okay. Uh, so for, first, keeping vulnerabilities out of production, right? As developers, uh, you know, why do we want to keep vulnerabilities out of production? We want to keep uh, vulnerabilities out of production because as we, uh, as we go from development to production, risk increases. Uh, it's like a cheesy animation, right? Uh, risk increases as we go across. Cost also increases to fix those bugs as they, as they get to production. And then once bugs reach production, they sit and stagnate, uh, and they might be found by your quarterly uh, penetration test or your security assessment, or uh, somebody might report it, you know, a good citizen on the internet, uh, or, you know, it might be found um, maybe a year later. And so the risk is much greater once they reach production and as developers, since bugs are emitted from our fingertips, uh, they, uh, we have the ability to stop them from being emitted from our fingertips or, or you know, try. Uh, one interesting thing there is that, that, well, here's Jurassic Park again. Your scientists were so preoccupied with whether they could, they didn't stop to think they should. And I saw some tweet floating around that was, that was uh, beginner. Uh, I wrote a thousand lines of code today. Fantastic. Intermediate. I deleted a thousand lines of code today. Expert. I prevented code from being written, and I don't have who that is attributed to. But that's a great place to start. Code that's unwritten and does not exist, that is not a feature that does not have surface area in your environment, can't be compromised. So if you didn't write that feature, it can't be compromised. One interesting thing to start uh, to talk about, I'm babbling. One interesting thing is uh, at the start before code is ever written, and this is applicable through the entire sort of process, uh, is, is threat modeling. And it is, a, it is a fancy word, and there's a lot to learn. There's a, there's a great book. Um, it's uh, Threat Modeling, uh, Designing for Security. Uh, it's, a great, uh, it's a great read. It's 300 plus pages if you really want to get into it and learn the, the intricacies of threat modeling. But I'll give you the sort of the quick and, uh, quick and dirty version, which is, it's when you think ahead about what could go wrong, weigh the risks, uh, think about things, and take the appropriate action. That's threat modeling. When you try to predict the future, when you try to think about uh, what are your security constraints, what do you want uh, this application to do, how do you want to pr protect it, what promises you're making to your users, and then what are you putting in place to appropriately uh, cover those risks? Uh, and that might be just, uh, uh, you know, for uh, spoofing, you might, you might just put an authentication system in, non-repudiation, um, you might have two-factor or something. Um, you know, these are all, these, these are just fancy words for things that we do every day, but it's good to think about and talk about before you write any code. Uh, it, it tends to shake out design flaws uh, or things that you might not have thought about. Now, we all write tests, and, and uh, Gregor mentioned 100% you know, test coverage in his, his talk is, is a great thing, and I, I agree that 100% test coverage is great. It's also, from the security perspective, it's a myth. It's, it's, once you reach 100% test coverage, you've hit the baseline. You've touched all the conditionals in your, your application, but you haven't uh, compensated or covered uh, potential misuse cases. Uh, I'm going to tell you a story, sort of an embarrassing story about the Node Security Project. We're, uh, we're working on um, some new service offerings, and we have 100% test coverage. That's like a, a, a thing for our project. And uh, one day we got contacted by one of our partners that said, hey, there's a, there's a couple of advisories that we're getting in our feed that are not showing up in the public advisory uh, database. And we actually, had a, we actually leaked a, a couple of advisories that were not public yet, uh, only through a specific route. Because a SQL statement didn't have a couple brackets 
checking a, a particular uh, logical condition. Our code had 100% test coverage. We did not account for that particular case. We have tests for that now, but we didn't. Um, it's an embarrassing story. Uh, this is Unix. I know this. This is, this is my piece about sort of the technical knowledge um, about uh, what it is that we uh, uh, know about things like cross-site scripting and SQL injection. I have confidence that all of you can go look at those references like the OAuth top 10 and you can go understand the technical knowledge. But the thing to um, not get stuck up on is the intrinsic knowledge that we do know this. This is a Unix system. I know this. Do you really know this? That's my daughter. Bye. Um, <laughs> she apparently does not know Unix. Okay, so yet. The, the, uh, the intrinsic knowledge that, that we do know something, because the sands shift underneath us. The, the environment changes, browsers change, and so to know something, is, is, that's a really difficult thing to say. So we need to be always approaching our technical knowledge about uh, the features and the things that we're using, the technology that we're using, and the, the aspect of security, just, just be always craving that knowledge. One thing that I think is really useful um, is pull request reviews. Most, uh, you know, all of us, I think, do that as a good, as a good practice in our projects. Um, and I want to share sort of what I look for when, uh, when I or the team does a pull request review from a security perspective. Um, it's a simple thing to just say what sources are syncs, what sources of input, or uh, what interesting things. Is it going to a database? Is it going to a file? Is it going, you know, where is it going? Is it going to a browser? Uh, what new dependencies were added? Do those dependencies have known vulnerabilities? Um, what new technologies were added? You know, we just added some, you know, random cache over here or something over there. How did that change the behavior uh, of the application? Those are things that I look at, and those point me to the, to the areas that might have vulnerability. Don't give a plus one on a pull request if you don't believe that you've covered it uh, fully. If you don't believe that you can have ownership in shipping uh, that particular pull request, don't give a plus one. Put in there that I looked at these things, I, I feel that it needs a little more attention, but it's e I've done it. I've, I've just thrown that plus one in there. Yeah, I looked at a few things. It looks good, but also include, I think is important, include what you did in the pull request. A plus one doesn't really give anybody, uh, do anybody any good. Um, they're going to have to guess at what you looked at and what you blessed that pull request for. Uh, I feel that... Um, uh, I don't know what I feel. I've lost my track. Uh, so that's, that's basically it for, 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 for pull requests. Um, Automation is a great way to keep vulnerabilities out of production, right? You've got uh, things like CI, right? That, like, oh, I'm going to go back. Um, pull requests are, are, are one of your last efforts to stop bugs from getting into production, right? So. Uh, that was the thing I missed. So automation, CI. CI is going to run our tests. It's going to say that they're all 100%. They're all good. That's great. You should, you should strive to have that. Uh, things like Greenkeeper, uh, to keep your dependencies up to date, are is, is such a fantastic idea. Um, because chances are, out-of-date dependencies are, what are the things that are going to have security vulnerabilities in them. Uh, and then, of course, uh, plugging the node security project. Uh, this is a thing that you can add to your CI, it's just N, uh, NPMI, NSP, run it on your project, and it's going to tell you if you have known, dependent, known vulnerabilities in your dependencies. And it can, you can just add it to Travis, uh, and you can fail, uh, fail your build if you want. Uh, one, one thing that I think is really important uh, for security tools and security information is that you stay in your workflow. Uh, the security community loves to build tools and loves to build technologies to help you know, companies and enterprises and developers ship better software, but chances are you have to use a separate tool, you have to have domain knowledge. I really like bringing the security knowledge to stay in your workflow. If you, this, is a, this is sort of a preview of NSP Live that we're working on, uh, a service basically to support the NSP project, right? Uh, we want to make it our full-time job. This is something that we're working on. And it brings that data, that knowledge that we have into your flow. Uh, I think that's super important. Um, we're also doing it for NPM Enterprise. Uh, as well as NPM, that's going to show up uh, sometime soon. So there's a sneak peek. Don't tell the rest of the internet. Um, so production codes. We've, we've kept vulnerabilities out of production. Uh, now let's talk about production code, because as developers, 
we ship it across this line and it gets punted into production. And until a user, until a bug comes back into our world, uh, interrupting feature development or whatever, and we get that lands on our issue tracker, we, we tend to ignore production code. Um, so I think it's important to actively actually engage in production code uh, and to uh, not think about that, that line between, that line in the sand between dev and production uh, as a reason to stop interacting with it. Things that I think, um, monitoring, you don't need to hear this to know that a giant dinosaur uh, is coming for you or somebody's just shaking the vehicle. Um, behind the scenes, but monitoring, you know, listening to your, the error messages, listening to, the, to, the, to your logs tells you about what's happening in your application. That's that pulse, 500 messages, right? Are you, are you actively addressing those? Do you have a service that's collecting those, and are you doing something about it? And sure, there's a balance between new uh, you know, bug fixes and uh, feature development, but that's, that's a way that you can actively engage production code and make things better before somebody exploits it. 500 messages, um, authorization uh, denied, those type of messages in your logs give you an indication about what somebody's doing out there on the internet with your application. Uh, tools, um, I was gonna put a picture of Trump but it didn't fit with the theme. So, uh, the uh, tools, I went there, sorry. Um, SSL labs, uh, some, some interesting tools for production code. Run, run your site. If you're not using SSL, and you're, there's no excuse at this point. Let's encrypt, free certs, go check it out. Just have SSL, SSL, all the things. Uh, and then go make sure that you're uh, configured properly. This is a great tool. It'll tell you if you're configured properly. Securityheaders.io. Again, security headers are a really cheap and easy way to get security uh, in production. Uh, drop in a few lines into your you know, Fravit Express, happy application, whatever, and you get some... Uh, you know, get some nice security headers, uh, get some security for free. You see that uh, for the NSP uh, site, we're currently uh, missing a couple things. We don't have content security policy enabled uh, or public key pins. So uh, the other thing is, is with some of these scanners like security headers, this is going to tell you for your base site. If you don't apply those things consistency, consistently across uh, all of your pages, it might be great for your front page, but then once you get logged in, maybe that policy changes and maybe you... Uh, turn off security headers or turn off uh, CSP for uh, some page that uh, needs it. Be, be clear when you turn those things off and apply, apply things consistent, consistently. All right, so uh, internal bug hunts. A lot of organizations, this is a scene where he uh, tugs on the, the fence and it's great, no raptors can get through that. So, uh, you know, we already do, many organizations and many, uh, you know, dev teams do uh, uh, sort of like hackathons or feature feature, uh, you know, builds, and, you know, you know long, uh, long days, caffeine-filled, uh, you know, sort of lack of sleep building features. And I actually think that, that it should be, uh, hackathons should claim their name back for, for actually hacking things internally. You know, do the internal bug hunts have, uh, that I think would actually probably be more useful is to have an internal bug hunt. Um, instead of creating more surface area, you're making the surface area that you already have more secure. Uh, so, you know, you could also, you know, do, do them alongside of your feature hackathons. Have one team focus on uh, securing a feature while the other team's building it. So that's uh, sort of my, uh, uh, the last thing about production code, I guess, is uh, penetration testing. I actually think, um, let's see, so, so one of my, my full-time job is a penetration tester, right? I run a team of uh, five penetration testers, and that's what we do. We test, we test applications for vulnerabilities. Um, and one thing that I think is super important and that we promote as we do uh, our tests is that um, don't use the results of whatever you get back as a checklist, right? I see, it, I see it pretty often, right? You go down through, you fix this bug, you fix this bug, you fix this bug, you ask us to retest, we retest, uh, the report comes back clean, you're secure, right? Remember, binary one or zero, that's not true. Uh, it's just that, you know, you've now checked off the things that we found. If we're doing it black box and doing it externally, um, chances are we might have found a percentage of those cross-site scripting vulnerabilities that you have, but you can just, you've noticed the pattern of, of the one area, the one that we did find, you can grep through your code base, and you can say, oh, all these other templates also have these unescaped variables. 
why do they have them? And you can question that. And so you can, get be- you can actually get better coverage uh, taking that report and then doing a little bit more work than we did if we didn't have that code. Um, let's see, that's what I'm going to say about that. And we're going to go to the final thing. I've got five minutes, so we're going to talk about sort of shifting uh, security c- culture. Um, and what I've learned over the years in working with dev teams and how that, uh, how it needs to happen uh, or how it can happen. So one thing I've learned is that uh, it has to happen from within. Uh, you, uh, somebody needs to put on uh, the uh, Jurassic Park security officer uh, badge and it needs to uh, take ownership of, take ownership of, security within a product, right? If there's no appointed person, uh, even if there's a security team, I really feel that uh, somebody needs to take on, just like you might uh, take on uh, performance uh, or some other aspect, uh, security is that, you know, that 20% that, you, that somebody needs to own. Um, the, what, the star there is because uh, when you go back to the penetration testing or the consultant that's gonna come in externally, I can say things to your boss that you can't say. And so it's really useful if you know that you're having a problem with security culture is to use that external consultant that's coming in to help you um, as a battering ram to, to make those statements or call those, uh, call those things out that you see. Um, even if it's a side note, just like, hey, by the way, they probably didn't tell you this, but this bad thing's going on, right? And we can bring those things up anonymously. So that's, that's an interesting uh, side note. Um, it has to have support from the right people. Um, right. And, and so you ha- this, I realized that doing security, you know, sec- security's hard. Uh, your, your job's already hard enough building all of the features uh, and trying to make it perform and get to market. Uh, you do have to have the support of 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 management. You do have to have the resources to put in that additional time. Um, and yeah, you have to have the support of your, your team. You're going you're gonna to get pushback. You're going to get pushback from management. Um, you're going to get pushback from uh, other teammates. Um, that's why I think it's so critical to have to, for it to happen from within is that uh, you, already, you have trust. Um, the external person can say it, but it's going to catalyze and take action internally uh, much better. Also, don't expect this to, to, to happen all at once. Um, it, it, it won't happen overnight either. Uh, when I got my job at And Yet uh, as a chief security officer, I was like, cool, I can go in and I can change all of the things. And everyone was like, screw you, we're not going to change all the things. And I was like, but I want to change all the things for the better. And I had to resort to changing one thing. And then we built that as a habit. And then we changed the next thing. We built that as a habit, and we moved on. We did the stair step thing to get our way to the top. We're still not to the top because there's no top, but we're working on it, right? Um, included this um, mostly for Jeff Goldblum, but um, one thing that you're going to run into is you're going to run into. Um, Again, pushback from management, the right people involved. You, nobody ever got fired for shipping awesome features. Uh, but people uh, tend to not like uh, you bringing up this giant issue right before you're supposed to go to market. Uh, and you want, management to, to, you want support from management to slip a feature, right? So the earlier you can tell them about potential issues, the better. Um, you also have to have the trust of management um, for you as a team to be able to make the call to stop a release if you feel something's important enough. And I'm going to give you a tool um, that somebody named Rafalos, the white rabbit, um, uh, that I heard from years ago, uh, a, a great idea. And that is, the, uh, that is a piece of paper where you and the team write down what you feel the risks are, uh, what you feel the, the, what's going to need to go into it uh, to fix it. You sort of like give your whole story. And then you go pitch that to management, and then they say, like, uh, no, just, just ship it anyway. And then you, you slide it across the table, and you hand them a pen, and you say, sign here to accept this risk. 
Put your ass on the line for this thing that we're bringing to you. That's a, that's a little bit over the top, but it's a way to get across that we as a team think this is really important and that we should stop the build because of this security thing or stop going to production. Um, finally, accountability, trust, uh, sort of enforcement. I talked, I kind of put all that into to the other thing. I'm going to talk about um, enforcement a little bit. Uh, enforcement is done, I think, back in pull request land. That's where your chance is to enforce good habits on the team uh, at that point, where you can teach and lead your knowledge about security to the other members of the team. Um, you, don't, you want that to start to grow. You want to promote a culture where you don't have to stay on people uh, quite as hard because then you're just going to get, you're going to get, you're going to get compliance. Um, compliance is great as a starting point, um, but you want to build a habit. You want to help people build the habits, and pull requests are going to be the way to sort of do that. Also, people have to be accountable for the code that they write, right? Um, and pull requests give you the opportunity to sort of um, call, call their bluff on that. Uh, and the last thing here is that, uh, you know, in the movie Jurassic Park, uh, Jeff Goldblum says, God help us, we're in the hands of engineers. And it's used as a negative in that movie. Uh, and I don't think that's a negative. I actually think that's a positive. In terms of uh, the future, uh, you all have the ability to uh, learn the knowledge to stop the bugs from creeping out of your fingers. You have the knowledge to, when that accidentally does happen, to, to stop that at pull requests and to help each other on your team, in your community, to uh, ship better code. And you have the ability to uh, continue that into production and not be complacent about, well, it's shipped, it's not my problem anymore. You all have that ability. Uh, so, uh, yes, God help us, we are in the hands of engineers. So, thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much, Adam. Come on over. I love this couch, this is the best. <laughs> Welcome to the couch. So, um, thank you so much for your talk. There's a lot of like, great low-hanging fruit that I think everyone can take a look at whatever they're working on and apply those changes. So that's super awesome, thank you so much. Um, so, let's see, uh, how do you feel about the new Jurassic Park movie? You seem to love Jurassic uh, Park, so I don't know how you feel about the new one. Actually, I only remember the original one, and I've, I, I have seen the new one. Uh, I don't remember the ones in between. I'm sure all the dinosaurs get out and they eat everybody and everybody dies, but uh, uh, the old, the I, maybe, maybe not care everyone about. has seen it. I don't want to give spoilers. Oh, that's right. I mean, it's yeah, good. they're all kind of a similar plot. Like, there's a big plot, like big, big security hole, and then... Yeah, they, kinda... never, they never seem to learn from their mistakes. <laughs> yeah, just like the... Uh, history repeat itself. There's something, there's, there's an analogy to security there somewhere, but <laughs> I'm not. Okay, but now for a serious question. Um, are you swift on security? <laughs> so uh, if you don't know, it's, this is a Taylor Swift parody account Twitter that tweets about security things. Um, just wondering if that's you. Maybe I'm outing you right now, I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe he's... <laughs> Do you, I, yeah, I don't have that caliber of humor. Uh, <laughs> it's, if you don't follow that account, it's a fantastic account. It's uh, hilarious. Yeah, um, no, I am not uh, swift on security. You'll have to try again. Um, okay, so uh, we talked about, you know, you talked about a lot of low-hanging fruits. So what's the most, like, common security flaw that you um, come across in, like, the type of work that these people might be doing? Lack of input validation. Mm. So... Uh, just letting whatever in the front door. Um, we audit a lot of Node applications, Express applications. Express has complex query string parsing on by default, where it's not just key value, it's uh, you can create a complex object out of that. And if you happen to be using Express and Mongo, which is a very popular combination, and you're putting that user input into uh, straight into Mongo query, uh, Mongo query or something, you can... Um, create very interesting queries that uh, you basically know SQL injection. It's very common in Express and Mongo mashups. So. That's terrifying. That's just one. Everyone you know. go, go to your laptop. Don't go on your laptops. You're not supposed to have them in the audience here. But uh, you and no peer -to -peer. definitely check 
no peer-to-peer -peer, uh, downloading anything also. Um, so, okay, so now that, because you know so much stuff about security, you know about all these holes, or you know more than the average person, okay. I would say, right? We know about all this, like how do you navigate the web ever, like knowing that all these security holes exist? You're assuming I navigate the web. Oh. No, <laughs> no, uh, I, I, basically I constantly look for these things, so I don't, I don't use the web normally. I, um, I get a lot of email to like, bra like bracket script alert, like hi, bracket script alert, thank you for signing up for our service. Um, yeah, I never get the web really strangely. Um, so wait, how do you, as a, as a browser, how do you avoid these things then? Like, how, how, do, how do I avoid these things? Um, luck and happenstance. Uh, let's see, that's, a, that's an interesting question because, uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not the paranoid security person. Okay, so you, like, you trust the cloud? Yeah, or no, don't trust old, the cloud. old man yells at cloud. Uh. Yeah, uh, yeah. I don't know how to, how to answer that. I, I sort of like if things feel wrong, right? Like if you get a big long, you get a, a link somebody sends you that that's got a big nasty, you, <laughs> you know, payload in the end. Like yeah, I'll look it over and it looks you know interesting or whatever. Um, yeah, I, I won't won't click it or I'll go straight to the site, right? Like I mean, the standard sort of practices keep keep all your crap up to date. Yeah. Um, I don't know. All right. Thank Dabble. you so much, Adam. Thanks.